Jules, as you all know, is our secretary. And so thanks to her for organizing this evening and running the um, technology. And for those who are new to Thorny Island, I'm the chair of the, uh, the society. Um, before in introducing our speaker this evening, I've just got a couple of points to make about our programme going forward. Um, there are a number of events still to uh, sign up for before the, uh, before the autumn, but it is a slightly odd programme and an odd year between uh, now and then because we are finally able to put on two in-person events. Uh, which should have run, can you believe, two years ago in 2020 in person. Um, but they are unfortunately, obviously, are all sold out. So that's why the programme is a bit odd. Uh, but we're absolutely thrilled at last to be able to do that, particularly because one of them, we decided to do something completely different and to, to visit a local college, the Westminster Kingsway College, so that we'll learn a little bit more about the young people who are learning a number of different skills there, including... Um, catering. Um, so that's going to be a particular delight. And we're having lunch there um, as well. Um, but there are two more Zoom talks um, in April and July. Uh, and of course, there's our summer party in June. And I will remind you about those in the follow up email to this event, uh, when I also um, include the link to the uh, our YouTube uh, channel. Um, anyway, it's my uh, pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Brian Bosey, um, talking about the sensational history of Petit France revealed. Um, it's really interesting because Brian's a, a Whitehall lawyer. Uh, he's based in Petit France um, and he's, he's always made it a point of researching the history of the exact location wherever he works. And during lockdown as an activity, he developed this talk uh, for his colleagues. Um, so he is going to share it with us this evening. He plans to talk for about an hour uh, and then we'll have the usual Q&A. So if you would put your questions in the chat, uh, Jules, are you okay to read these out as usual? That would be tremendous. Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much for coming everyone and I'll hand over to you now, Brian. Right, so we get the slides going. So I'm gonna go on to slideshow I think it was our routine and then I'm going to share screen I think that oh, no I share screen first don't I, I think that there that's what I do um, can you see that is that Not shared yet. oh no no that'll be shared is that shared that's looking good story of petty France right now we're going to slideshow Why is the slideshow working? Um, from beginning, yeah. That's it, okay. perfect. I think we're ready to go. That's uh, it. Are we all ready? Yep, looks yep, great. Yeah, all happy. Can I, uh, well, Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Brian Bosey, um, and I'm very pleased to be with you. I, I have followed you, your, uh, I, 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 was, I, was, I was kind enough to be allowed to listen to your last event, which was very interesting. And uh, I, I'm gonna get the credits in early. Um, so uh, Vic, I am a fan of yours. And, and I think you were doing some work on Petit France about the same time I did. So um, I think you might recognize one or two things here. So um, I want to give you credit for that right away. Um, so we've got quite a lot to get through. We've got about 500 years to get through. Um, but we start with that rather a banal street that we know today. Uh, and curiously, it's called Petit France. And that's one of the mysteries which we're going to get to the bottom of. So my building uh, is that uh, great modernist classic in the middle. Uh, now, the address of that building is actually well, one we use is 102 Petit France. Uh, there are not 102 houses there anymore, of course, so we'll see what happened to them. Uh, but what we call it um, in GLD is 102 PF. So when I talk about 102, uh, I will be referring to that 
whole site, or I'll say the site of 102, but that is what I mean by when I say 102, because that's what we call it. Now, just to get uh, the boundaries here, I've, I've I first thought I'd do a talk for the uh, for the the, the uh, my colleagues, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll tell them a bit about where they go at lunchtime. So, sort of, where do you wander around at lunchtime? And so, broadly, you've got Petit France here. You go up to Stratton Ground. Uh, there's Christchurch Gardens. And maybe you go up to St James's Park. Now, as it happens, that actually follows the old Christchurch Parish which is that number 25 sort of triangle there. That's the old Christchurch there. And that line there, the boundary actually goes through the canal of St. James's Park. So on the, in the one corner, you've got the barracks. In the other corner, you've got Queen Anne's Gate. And then you've got Victoria Street there. And I thought, well, that's sort of really where we go for lunch, more or less. And it's rather neatly. In a, so in a traditional way, I build this as the, the talk of the parish. Of course, uh, the parish didn't last very long. It was only from about 1840 to 1940. Um, uh, but that, that's what the, the root of this is. So it's your traditional parish talk. But the original parish church was uh, the St. Margaret's Church, which was built by the Benedictine monks at the Abbey for the locals in the community around the same time as the Abbey was built. So you'll know St. Margaret's, Margaret's Church over there. And the area that we're interested in, of course, runs up from there, up through that gate into Tothill, and then that will take us up into Petit France. Now, this artist impression, which of course comes from your website, um, is apparently around about the time when our story starts, which is uh, around about 1350. That's before that, I don't think there was very much at all at Petit France. Uh, it, it probably originally, the, the road probably followed uh, probably a, a tributary of the Tiber, and that's how you get the shape of it, but that got covered over by the, so the time we get to about 1350, uh, a, a road has developed there. And our story really begins with Edward III, uh, who had a very ambitious uh, mother and a French wife, a French mother too, and uh, he had a quite a legitimate claim to the crown of France. This is around the time, I don't know if you've seen the recent film um, uh, about uh, the uh, um, duel, it's called The Last Duel, I think, um, but it's around about that time. But um, uh, he uh, decided he wanted to build up uh, his contacts, the Flemish connection, because he could see that there could be opportunities in France. Of course, at that time, the English crown owned southwest of France, but he wanted to build up a presence in the north uh, to open up uh, a trading route to Flanders. So he, of course, this was the famous Battle of Cressy. Uh, he was victorious. And then, crucially, he got up to Calais. And the siege of Calais, 1346, he, he was starving the population to death. Famously, the, the burghers of Calais came out and pleaded uh, and offered their lives to save the city. Um, and his wife, who, it was a great love story, him and his wife, and they, he, his wife beseeched him to uh, show um, uh, magnitude, and he did. And not only that, he saved the town, and he didn't um, hang them either. And you may know that it is commemorated uh, in Victoria Tower Gardens as a gift from France during the First World War. So that's the Burgers of Calais. And that's the sort of strategic uh, position that Edward wanted to establish. So he wanted to build up this trade here to Flanders, um, as well as um, uh, the other Southwest France connections. And of course, we had a pandemic uh, that arrived very soon after that, amazingly enough. What was the effect of the Black Death? Well, of course, the serfs left the, the, the agriculture and the Lord said to find another way of making money, which was sheep. They enclosed the land and, of course, that became a big money spinner. And Edward III realised that. Um, and it was Edward III who actually introduced the wool sack into the King's Council, uh, which is there today. So that became this enormous industry uh, for England. And we, we know how important that was at that time. Now, specifically, uh, Edward set up 
staple markets. A staple was an instrument for measuring the weight of the wool, but that's what the, the wool markets became known as, staples. He established several, but the most important was uh, in Westminster at Petit France. He, so he established um, in the road of Petit France uh, a place for the French merchants who could come over from Calais, which is now a, an English colony. He established a, another market for the wool staplers, who are the um, uh, tradesmen uh, in this country, um, uh, in Westminster. And that company that uh, of, of the staple traders actually was established by Royal Charter and it still exists. So that was the staple market. So I, I, I imagine uh, Petit France uh, would have been not dissimilar to something like that. It would have been a very busy uh, market for textiles. Of course, the, the wool was exported mainly for processing to Flanders, but it, it would, this was the key market for wool throughout the whole country. This is where it all came to, uh, to be exported. And the reason it was a controlled market was because the king wanted the customs duty on it. So the staple traders uh, became the most important merchants in the country. They developed mercantile law. And we've got a good idea of where they might have worked and what Petit France might have looked like because the Merchant Adventurers Hall you may have visited in York um, and it, it is in a beautiful condition and the Merchant Adventurers were wool exporters and they traded through the staple in a staple market at Petit France. They were very well to do, they were wealthy merchants, they, they were particularly wealthy because Yorkshire was so successful at wool, particularly because of the abbeys. But this building, I think, probably gives us a very good idea of what the staple market would have looked like at Petit France. That's my speculation. Uh, but I think it probably is a good indication. So that's where the, the uh, bales of wool would have been on the left. Um, so you can see they were a prosperous merchants. So I, I suspect it, that the building that went up in Petit France was probably something like this. Now, 200 years go by, very successful. In fact, it got so successful, they needed a greenfield site. So they moved up to Hoburn. You'll recognize that building, the Staple Inn building. That's why it's called Staple Inn, because it was the Staple Market. Um, and uh, of course, curiously, it's since been taken over by lawyers as has Petty France now. Uh, that is the one uh, main structure that actually survived the Tower of London. So that is the original building of 1585. That is the old staple market building um, and still extant. But that, that gives you an idea again of what the building uh, in Petit France probably looked like on the site of 102. And of course, for a Tudor building, that's a very substantial building. So maybe a floor higher than you would normally expect. Across the road, uh, where the uh, London Transport Building is, uh, Cornelius van Dun, uh, the chief yeoman of the guard to Henry VIII, left in his will, um, oh, in fact, before he died, he built 20 houses for poor women to dwell rent-free, and they, those lasted for 300 years. Um, he is commemorated in St. Margaret's Church. And I want you to hang on to his title, Yeoman of the Guard, because that's going to come up again. Uh, so we'll see that again. But you can now actually visualize already what uh, Petit France was looking like. We now know what the buildings more or less were looking like on both sides of the road just above Broadway. Now, another significant uh, uh, staple trader was William Caxton. He was based in Petit France and he was a trader. He went uh, to Flanders and he heard about this amazing technology called uh, a printing press at Gutenberg. He visited it and he thought, my goodness, this, this is better than wool trading. So he, uh, he set up in business uh, in the cloisters of the Abbey. But it's rather appropriate that there is that Caxton Street just near Petit France. So moving on, uh, now we get to 1600. This is more or less what it's looking like. Uh, the, the, the remarkable thing here is, so here we are, this is Petit France. This is the 
Here's uh, St. Margaret's Church, Parliament. Of course, there's no bridge at that time. Whitehall. Uh, Petit France then was the main road up to the north on the western side of London. And here's the other, here's Broadway, still that sort of shape you can recognize even today. And that would go, and this road out to Stratton Ground. Now this is an important through fare because at that time, there was only one bridge, London Bridge, which was very congested. And if you had a coach and horses or a cart, the only way of getting across the Thames was by London Bridge, which wasn't very an attractive option. There was one other way, which was by the horse ferry. Uh, so this attracted a lot of passing trade and it became a main through fair uh, round through Stratton Ground and the, the street market that was there round to the horse ferry. Uh, and that put Petit France on the map. Now, the, those buildings, that was pretty much the extent of development for several hundred years. Petty France didn't develop any more than that. So this is the absolute, absolutely sort of end of the development of building uh, in Western London at that time. Jumping ahead to the Civil War, again, you'll see, here's the Abbey, here's Petty France, uh, Broadway there. And again, the development hasn't extended much there. What you'll see here is, is this wall that goes all the way around the city, round across the river, all the way around. That's Cromwell's wall built of soil and earth. So to sustain cannonballs, it was very successful. Uh, and uh, Cromwell held London throughout. Um, in fact, the only people that actually stormed it was the new model army because he stationed them outside and they weren't paid. So they did uh, storm the wall and to get paid. Now we get our first famous resident at number 19 Petit France. So 19 Petit France uh, was on the location of 102 Petit France, uh, exactly at the end of Palmer Street. Palmer Street is that little road that runs up to Petit France where the, uh, the small St. James's Park tube station is. Uh, so right at the end of that road, if you can imagine where the end of the 102 building is now, was the house which at that time had the address of number 19. And John Milton lived there throughout the Commonwealth. So the, the, he was a key figure in the Commonwealth, uh, not for his poetry, uh, but for his Latin. He was the Latin minister, which really meant foreign minister at the time, because he could speak Latin. Uh, they, he was actually really the leading intellectual of the Commonwealth. And uh, before he was known for his poetry, he was known for his uh, political views. And really some of the principles that he espoused are what we associate now with liberal democracy. Um, so he was uh, very much a Republican, very much for freedom of speech and a lot of these uh, principles of, of liberal democracy we, we're familiar with today. Uh, of course, he was very disappointed when there was the restoration and a lot of the people uh, who fled England at that time took his ideas with him to the new world. Uh, so because he had to give up politics uh, on the restoration, he, uh, he continued with his poetry. In fact, he was writing uh, Paradise Lost all the time uh, he was there because he didn't have much to do as foreign minister because uh, England was something of a prior state. Now, famously, he, he was, he became blind at that time. He lost, two of his wives died and his daughters uh, took dictation. Um, and that all happened in that building, number 19. They do remember that number 19, it's gonna come up again. But of course we had another pandemic and uh, Milton uh, had to leave. He, uh, he fled to the house in Buckinghamshire, which is still, uh, a museum today, you can actually visit, visit it today. Another aspect of the Civil War, which was remarkable, was uh, what happened at Christchurch Chapel. Now, the Christchurch Chapel was on the grounds of the uh, square there, which you'll be familiar with, which has been renovated on the right-hand side. Uh, this was the burial ground, the overflow burial ground for the Abbey. So it was attached to the uh, St. Margaret's, to, sorry, uh, and St. Margaret's Church. So it was attached to the parish church, 
they built a, a, a chapel there and the the grounds extended across to what's Victoria Street today that was all part of the burial ground uh, the actual chapel was on the site of what's now the telephone exchange so from where we are looking it would be from the site of where the chapel was uh, on the left hand side you'll see a poster about the victory uh, of Battle of Worcester this was Cromwell's last victory which sealed uh, the Commonwealth and there was a documentary a few years ago with Michael Moore, the American uh, documentary maker, who he traced his uh, you know, family lineage, like uh, who do you think you are sort of thing. And um, he, he always imagined he was from Irish immigrants from the 19th century, but he was shocked to find uh, he was actually directly descended from a Scottish soldier who was marched from Worcester to uh, Christchurch Gardens. Uh, and they were all imprisoned in the chapel and some place up the uh, road where the cathedral is now. Many of them perished in terrible conditions uh, and many of them were buried uh, in Christchurch Gardens. In fact, a few years ago, they discovered another mass burial at Durham Cathedral uh, from survivors of the Battle of Dunbar. Same, similar sort of thing happened there. Uh, but Michael Moore's ancestor was lucky, if you like. He was shipped... Um, and I think the quote was, as a slave uh, um, uh, to America and then he, as an indentured laborer, and he, got, he was freed after seven years. So that's how Michael Moore's family got to the new world. And then we get the almshouse being built around about the same time as uh, the Commonwealth. Now, the almshouses went up uh, by bequest to James Palmer, who was a priest at the Abbey. And of course, that did extend further up uh, in other places, and it's still uh, known today in Rochester Row. The, the building, the first building, was where that office building is on the right, the Lloyds Bank building. Uh, that was where the almshouses were sited. So again, like the almshouses in Petit France, they were there for quite a long time. Now, I want you to hang on to his name, James Palmer because we're, we're going to come up with another Jay Palmer later on, and we wonder if there's any significance there. Uh, there are, of course, thousands of people, some remarkable people buried at Christ Church Gardens. I'm just going to pull out one, probably because he is particularly famous. He actually did successfully uh, steal the crown jewels, although the, the, uh, he was caught, he was brought down by a rugby tackle by the keeper of the tower before he could get away. Um, he got clemency from Charles II, some it seems he helped Charles II in an earlier life and Charles II again settled a uh, pension on him bizarrely more greater than the uh, keeper of the tower got um, when he died he was buried but his his creditors didn't believe it they thought he was such a con man he'd faked his death so they insisted his body was dug up in Christchurch Gardens to make sure it was him uh, and indeed it was now, you'll be familiar with that statue uh, there in the gardens, Purcell, uh, who uh, had a, a, a remarkable short life um, and rather strange statue, I think, but that's the, it's called the flowering of English Baroque. I think that's where they get the sort of flowers coming out of his head. I don't know if you, you like that, but um, I, I, I like to think that he would have played the organ at the, the new chapel. But he was certainly uh, well known and as the organist uh, at the Abbey, had enormous following. He wrote for a lot of great um, theatrical shows and we've got remnants and his music is still very much uh, used today in various different forms. His, uh, you know, England traditionally has always been mocked for the lack of composers we've got. Uh, and of course, Henry Purcell, was uh, our first great composer probably, but I, we will get to another great composer which uh, this parish can boast. So just remember that this is our first composer. I think it is remarkable also just the, he only lived to be 36 and a century later, almost to the year, Mozart was born and Mozart of course died at the age of 35. And when you think, if Beethoven had died at the age of 35, we'd only have three Beethoven symphonies. So you do wonder what Purcell would have produced uh, if he lived any longer. So jumping ahead 
to the 18th century. Queen Anne's Gate, which was that development there, very, it's very much uh, as you see it today, the, uh, the, the houses there. It wasn't called Queen Anne's Gate. And from all the maps I've seen right the way through history, I've never managed to see a gate, although those steps down there are basically what is there today. But there's never any, the, the word gate only came in in the Victorian era in the maps, but the, the main housing structure uh, you'll see there, this was built on the proceeds of a of uh, one of the um, uh, original uh, investors of the South Sea bubble, which was a sort of a, a slavery Ponzi scheme. And uh, he then, um, he was then made bankrupt and he had to sell all the houses. And those of you who like to follow house prices may like to know that each of those houses sold at auction for a thousand pounds in 1720. Now, this is, uh, it wasn't actually a through street. There was a wall there. Now that is significant because it was called Queen Anne's, Queen Square, but they made it a square. The reason they put the wall there and you can still see the statue of, uh, in the wall of Queen Anne where the wall is, w w was, they, they put that as a traffic calming measure. The, the traffic in Petty France was so great uh, that to encourage people to move there, they put a wall up so there wouldn't be any rat runs through Queen Anne's Gate. Now, this is a amazing website. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I do recommend you having a look at it. It's free access. Uh, it, it is amalgamation of various data about London on at several different periods where they've amalgamated all the different uh, statistics of births, deaths and marriages, crimes and so on. And you can search a particular lo locale in central London at a certain period using these maps and, and find out an amazing amount of information all at, at uh, one search. So do have a look at locatinglondon.org. Now, here we are looking closer at the site you'll see in the site of 102, it's now saying Bluebell Y, Bluebell Yard. So that's an inn. Uh, I wonder if those buildings uh, of the Staple Market were converted to an inn, but it, there's no doubt that that looks like a proper, a hostelry, uh, a what was called a station inn. And you can see several yards here, Blue Anchor Yard, one there, another here, another here, uh, quite a few of them. And these were called station inns. Down here, you see the chapel. Down there, there, there we are, there's the burial ground and there's the almshouses there. That was called Chapel Street in those days, it wasn't called Caxton Street. And then that wasn't called Broadway, that was Great Chapel Street, but this was, and that's still called Broadway there for the obvious reason, I suppose. So the station inns were, uh, the, obviously the stationary areas where you would get your coach and horses if you wanted to travel elsewhere in England. And they operated very similar to a railway station. That's how we get the word railway station from the station inns. So they were stationary areas where you could know you could get a, a, your coach and horses and they, the, the, they would have these yards famously with the arch going into it. There's one still surviving. I, I, you probably know the Georgian at Southwark, uh, which gives you a, a good idea of what it probably looked like. So that probably is a a reasonable uh, speculation of what 102 was looking like. And they would have a timetable, as you see on the left. Uh, so you'd look and see if you wanted the coach to York, and you could look it up, what the time was, what the price was, just like a railway timetable, really. And uh, in, uh, of course, this was a great attraction to high women. And they would frequent Petit France and they would frequent all those inns and get the info, inside information from the innkeeper of what wealthy personnel, personages were traveling that day and then go and, and hold them up. And most famously, of course, uh, was Dick Turpin, um, who, uh, <coughs> uh, of course, had his famous ride to York. Uh, now, there's a lot of uh, apocryphal stories about Dick Turpin, of course. But um, one thing that has been documented is he was a resident of Broadway. So he, we do know he lived in Petit France and uh, no doubt he was a frequenter of those inns. Um, 
he, uh, when he got to York, he took the name John Palmer, which I think is rather curious, because if you remember, uh, Palmer's Almshouses uh, was set up by a J Palmer, and I just wonder if that was in his head when he, he used that name. But anyway, it didn't do him any good, uh, and he was found guilty of murder and hung in York. Oops. Brookshank's drawing uh, may well be an indication of what life was like in those inns. Uh, so it seems it was a pretty wild time, I think, uh, if you went to Petty France. If you could go uh, and have a good um, sort of pub crawl all the way along there, and of course that's a rather clever uh, play on words, a gin court, which uh, sort of echoes Battle of Cressy, actually. I don't know if Brookshank was aware of that connection. Uh, there is one pub that remains from that period, which was the Adam and Eve, uh, which uh, was built in 1726 and it's got continuous history since then. It was, did occupy the site just next to, to it where, where it is today. And it does commemorate its connection uh, with the, uh, across the road, it's called the Adam and Eve, I think, um, in memory of John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. Um, and there's a little bit of a history there on the sign. There is one building, one original building from the 18th century in Petit France, that's a listed building, and that gives you a good idea of the sort of uh, stature of the houses that were built up in Petit France by this time. So though you had these inns, it was getting quite well to do and quite substantial houses. And this one has survived. That's a stable block that's been converted there. Uh, if you go onto the Historic England site, it can tell you a little bit more about it. But it just give you an idea, this is 1780, so this time of the Gordon riots. Uh, here's Petty France. And the red line indicates the allocation of troops put down the riots. And I think that tells you just how important Petty France was, uh, the fact that they've put, put uh, troops all the way along Petty France. They obviously thought that could be a troublesome area. Now, you'll notice over here, there's a bridge. So in 1750, it was the first bridge after London Bridge to be built. Uh, the watermen of the Thames were very effective lobbyists and resisted any bridges being built hundreds of years. But so this was the first bridge built. Now, of course, that's got great implications for Petty France because suddenly now, not only is it a through fare out of London to the west and the north, but it's also comes in from the south too. So you've got to have all that trade coming up from south of the Thames right into Petty France. Uh, and then we get the French Revolution. Well, what's the importance of French Revolution, the connection? here is in the name, it's, it's France. So what happened? Well, the well-to-do residents of Petit, of Petit France were aghast because people were associating their address with these awful revolutionaries in France. So they had a referendum in the street to rename the street. And one of the residents was the Duke of York. Uh, who is, of course, famously remembered uh, in the children's rhyme, rather unfairly, actually. He was actually a very good ministry administrator. But they decided to name the uh, street after the Duke of York. It's funny how history echoes itself, isn't it? Because I think there's a, there's a street today which is called, named after the Duke of York, the current Duke of York, and I think the residents want to rename it. But that's rather a twist on history. Now, you remember number 19, I told you to remember that. Well, we've got number 19, but now it's 19 York Street, but it is the same location. Um, but you see it's called York Street. So this is the site of 102. This is the building, York Street. And there you will see superimposed on it was, is that house of Milton's, uh, which is uh, exactly in that spot. And if you're interested, and I'm going to tell you a few more connections about this house, but you can, as a member of the public, you can go into the reception area. They can walk along the reception area to the desk, and there's a bench at the end, 
and you can sit on the bench. I'm going to stop you doing that. And you will be literally on the site of Milton's house. Not only will you be on the site of Milton's house, you'll be on the site of Jeremy Benson's house, who, who owned the house next door, and he was the landlord of number 19. Uh, you may have seen that plaque that's on the uh, 102 building at Queen Anne's Gate side. Uh, he was a great jurist, legal reformer. Uh, the invented what was called utilitarianism, which seems common sense today, but he came up with a novel idea of using legislation to reform society, which was considered quite radical then. Uh, so he was a great progressive um, and he uh, founded University College uh, and he was a great believer in science. So he left his body to science and you can still see his body there in the, in the college uh, mummified. Then we have our future residents, our residents now, who moved in. Uh, well, William Hazlitt was, uh, came well known as the uh, diarist, Nessiest of the Romantic period. He was great friends with Wordsworth and Coleridge and his diaries document um, his life uh, partly, which was spent at number 19. And he knew really a lot of philosophers. He was a journalist. But um, he wasn't particularly good at making money. He'd write long essays about Milton because he was a great fan of Milton. He put a plaque on the house about him. But that, even in uh, 1813, it didn't make you an awful lot of money. Uh, so Bentham evicted him. Uh, but he got a new tenant in. Uh, and instead of an essayist, he got a philosopher. Uh, so James Mill moved in. Uh, James Mill brought his young son, John Stuart Mill. Uh, and they all lived at one time or another at number 19, which was demolished in about 1880. And I just remember now, uh, thought, good opportunity to show the bridge. And of course, Wordsworth's fa famous poem uh, written upon the bridge, um, uh, though he, he may well have been visiting Hazlitt at the time, or at least a little later, that's 1802, that, that poem, but there, there's a good view of, of London. That's in the Museum of London. It's enormous panorama that the Museum of London's acquired. So then we get uh, Wellington Barracks built in uh, 1833. Uh, of course, that backs on to Petit France. Now, we're gonna come back to the chapel. If you notice the chapel there, remember that chapel, because that's got a story to it later on. Here's a view of the time of the Great Exhibition. Quite how they did this, I have no idea, because you think they didn't really have photography. So it is a view as if from a hot air balloon. Um, so there's Green Park, there's Petty France. Now what's remarkable here is the new through fair that's been cut through. Here's Victoria Street, cut through this for the first time. Because Petty France was so congested, they, they needed a bypass. And that was the idea of of Victoria Street. It actually predated the railway station. Uh, it was probably the first um, land or monument or whatever you want to call it road named after Queen Victoria. Now I say that because uh, King William was due to open this street uh, and preparations were well advanced for him to open it and he died. So Victoria came to the throne. They said they were going to name it King William Street. So, uh, so, uh, so instead they named it Victoria Street. So I think it's the first Victoria Street in the world. Now, here we have a, a map here, uh, just after that period. Here's Victoria Street cut through and uh, York Street here, right? Uh, I've put the pub in there just because it, the, to, that, of course that's, down on that corner. That, that was the brewery tap. There was a big brewery there. Uh, there's the artillery brewery where the apartment block is now. Um, House of Correction here, uh, of course, and then well-to-do apartment blocks sprouting up all the way along um, Victoria Street. But why did they come? So, well, they started to get developed because the railway arrived in 1868 to St. James Park Station. It was first of all open cut. So there's the station there. Um, 
And then electrification allowed uh, further development of the line. And that electrification had enormous consequences. And this is where we get Queen Anne's mansion. So this building is on the site most exactly of 102. And it's almost the same height as 102. Now, if you can imagine uh, in 1870s, that was a massive height. Uh, in fact, it was well outside what anyone thought was allowed. But there wasn't actually a strict rule on height. What there was was a, 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 some fire restrictions and you couldn't build higher uh, than it was safe for fire. But um, Hanke went to America, he saw these buildings going up and he saw with uh, the electrification, you could have these electric lifts could get people up and down. And um, so he just kept on building. And although Westminster Council did oppose him, they took him to court, um, he just uh, disregarded it. He was sort of a, a bit of a, a Donald Trump property developer, actually. Uh, but, um, and although you think, well, that looks a pretty ugly building, that couldn't have done very well. Uh, it was the bit tallest building in London outside of the cathedrals. Uh, and yet it was extremely popular uh, with uh, wealthy and famous and MPs and so on. They loved it because uh, inside it was sort of like a some sort of uh, cruise ship, but you'll see how dominant it was. It created this enormous sort of dark canyon along Petit France there. There's another view of it uh, from Broadway. And there we are, the aquarium. I know you had a presentation of that recently. There's There, there it is there. So it really became a really well-known monument but inside, apparently, really was uh, tremendously attractive. And it was the sort of model for it was rather like a cruise ship today. The, you, you would have your rooms, but you wouldn't have a kitchen. Uh, the big selling point of this, the great luxury of this, this building, was that there was two bathrooms on each floor, not in, e not in each apartment, on each floor that was considered the height of luxury. You didn't have to go to another floor to find a bathroom. Uh, and so if you wanted to dine, you would go to one of these well-appointed dining rooms. There'd be a snooker room. There was a concert hall. There was a theater. It was just like a cruise ship. And I, I imagine I put a, a Jeeves and Worcester there because I, I sort of imagine a Jeeves and Worcester sort of characters liking that. It was a very popular pet a -terre for people, wealthy people from the country. And it was mentioned in, in Howard's End rather uncomplimentary, which is a lot about property and about how the family there were uh, sort of uh, had to live under the shadow of this awful building called the Wickham Mansions. But it does have a great claim to fame because Elgar deliberately took an apartment in Queen Anne's Mansions, especially to write his great violin concerto. Now Elgar, of course, was known for his love of countryside. He, he had a place in the Malvern Hills he got his inspiration from the country. But of course, before recorded music, uh, if you wanted to, if you really seriously wanted to listen to music and orchestras, you had to be in London. So he had to be in London and um, he he had this, he was a violinist himself. And uh, Fritz Kre Felix Kreisler was the great doyen uh, violinist. So he wrote this with Kreisler and with his music publisher. Now the intriguing thing is, you can, if you look at his diary, which you can see there on the on his website, it does detail uh, every day. He's he says what he's doing. I'm going back to QAM. He called it back to write more of the concerto. I've done the first part. Felix is coming to listen to it. We're going to try that. So it's very much rooted in Queen Anne's mansions. He talks about QAM all the time, and he talks about I rather like the, the touches. He says Felix is coming, so I've ordered a, a hamper from Harrods for lunch. Uh, so you can imagine how they sort of live. Um, and well, people think it was sort of optimistic piece of music, though if you read his diaries, uh, he wrote it in February of 1910 and his friend had just died. And then the king died, his great patron and friend, uh, even while he was writing that concerto. And it's all written up in the diary. Whoops. So, Here's Booth's socioeconomic map. Now the yellow are wealthy, right? So you've got, here's 102, here's Queen Anne's mansions here. Uh, Queen Anne's 
gay, of course, wealthy. And all the way along, what happened was it was so popular, these apartment blocks after Queen Anne's mansions, they got built up all the way along what was, became Scotland Yard up there. Saint, er what's now St. Ermans Hotel, that was a mansion block. And all these blocks, all the way of Victoria Street, all mansion blocks, artillery mansions are still there, made into apartments now, of course. Uh, but the, these, all this yellow was all well to do. So often they would, people would have a place in the country and they would have their pet out here in Victoria Street. Now th this gives you a bit of a close up of Queen Anne's mansions, a courtyard, as there is a, there's an atrium there today, more or less on the same spot. On the left hand side is Niagara Hall. And that's what we're gonna consider now. That's part of the barracks now, but that was a really big uh, tourist attraction that was built. Um, originally to show people what Battle of Waterloo looked like. Um, and then that was uh, so popular that the Belgians actually built their own panorama at Waterloo itself. Uh, then it was replaced, oh, the Battle of El Kabir, we forget that now, but that was sort of like the Suez of the day. It was a famous battle where the British beat the Egyptians to, to uh, save the Suez Canal. And then it was replaced by the Niagara Cyclorama with an American Indian village experience. And uh, there, there's the ticket hall. They, they had all you could experience what it was like to be an American Indian. And then it became an ice rink. It was a uh, electrification allowed the freezing of ice. Uh, that was converted to that. That became a, a world championship site for ice skating. And then it became a famous garage. Um, uh, of course, this is very early motor cars. Uh, when you, you needed mechanics, you needed somewhere to garage it. Buckingham Palace used this uh, for their garage. And um, it was a chauffeuring garage up until 1970. And Wolseley uh, took it over before they had their showroom in Piccadilly. Now we come back to York Street. Suddenly it changes its name. 1922 changes its name. Why did it change its name? I don't know for sure. Uh, my speculation is they all reorganized the postcodes at that time. Uh, they, 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 they started using numbers. And I wonder if it was to do with that, but I haven't found another uh, York Street in SW1. There is one in W1, but that's the only reason I can think of, but I'd be interested to know anyone has got any theories on that. Anyway, they decided to revert to a name that hadn't been used for 150 years, which is a rather odd name to, for a street in London, but there we are, so be it. Uh, and then up rises like uh, the most, another most amazing building in London at the time, even taller than uh, Queen Anne's mansions. And the reason they, Westminster Council did bring in regulations on height, uh, but it was for an occupied building and how they, uh, Holden got over that was he built this tower at the top which was unoccupied so it was actually taller than Queen Anne's mansion so he could claim it was the tallest building in London outside of the cathedral and it is an absolute uh, really masterpiece of uh, um, modern 1930s uh, art deco. Charles Holden always refused a, a knighthood because he said architecture is a uh, team effort, but he was responsible not only for the 1920s and 30s tube stations, uh, but also the what they call the Oxblood tube stations of the Edwardian period. And he lived to see his great uh, Piccadilly stations and so on, underground tubes used as bomb shelters in the war. So he was something, something a hero of mine. Now, the statues on the uh, buildings are remarkable very controversial at the time. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the detail of that, you took it at the top right, it does look rather dubious. Um, Eric Gill, in fact, uh, when his diaries were found after his death, uh, it turns out he was a dubious character. And curiously, there was a demonstration at the Broadcasting House where Eric Gill had a, got a similar statue there on Broadcasting House a few weeks ago. Someone was trying to knock that statue off uh, for similar uh, reasons, because for the indecency and the fact of Eric Gill's history. Uh, he also was responsible for the BMA building in 
now the Zimbabwe building in uh, opposite Charing Cross. This is at the inside of Broadway, 55 Broadway, the London Transport Building, being converted to a hotel now. Those are the executive offices in Walnut. Uh, that on the right is now the reception area. It did used to be part of the station until the 1970s. And the station itself is a grade one listed building. Those of you like me who are pedants for apostrophes uh, may have noticed the difference in the sign signage of the use of the apostrophe S and St. James's Park. So um, spot the difference there. Uh, and how those builders got up there. So they're building that tower right there. And uh, so there you can see there's Queen Anne's mansions. We're coming around here. Here's the mansion blocks that came Scotland Yard. Here's the church. We're just going to take a quick little detour into the town hall, Westminster Town Hall, Caxton Hall. There it is. Uh, they finally found us something to replace the old Caxton Hall speaking halls, which were behind the town hall here. This was a remarkable hall. Amazing events took place there. The first Pan American Af African Conference, which uh, really was laid the foundations for the African independence movement and desegregation in America. Uh, suffragettes appropriately. Today, International Women's Day, that was the origin of International Women's Day was the suffragettes movement. Um, and they had mock parliaments in Caxton Hall and then marched onto parliament. Uh, there was the assassination of uh, the uh, General Dyer, who was blamed for Amritsar um, and uh, the massacre there. And of course, curiously echoed by the assassination of Indira Gandhi um, 42 years late, 44 years later. Uh, Churchill was banned from the BBC as a warmonger in the 30s. So he spoke in at Caxton Hall as he did during the war. And of course, it became a famous registry office. There's Elizabeth Taylor right down there somewhere. You can see her. And she came back uh, for the wedding of her son. She's there with Richard Burton. Now, we got into the war. Uh, the, uh, I, I use that battleship because it was, um, they were called Queen Anne's Mansions. These enormous ships they built after the First World War were actually called Queen Anne's Mansions. The, the Admiralty took over uh, Queen Anne's Mansions after the war, immediately got bombed. But uh, to give Hanky his due, it did stand up to the war. But it's all, that was all a military base by that time. And the Wellington Barracks got hit as well, uh, as indeed did Christchurch. So that was the end of the parish. It didn't quite last 100 years. Three firemen were killed in that fire. One of the worst Knights of the Blitz destroyed that church. Uh, but perhaps the greatest loss of all was the Guards Chapel. Uh, immediately after VA, the first V1 bomb that took any casualties was a direct hit on the Guards Chapel, uh, which was a book was written about it. It was a devastating blow. If I, Fortunately, Hitler didn't know just how successful he was in hitting a military base. And of course, now that modernist replacement, I do encourage you to look inside it. Uh, it is remarkable, nevertheless, the replacement building. And they used to have free concerts there at lunchtime for lockdown. So we're getting on to um, uh, the next building. So here's uh, 102 here. This was the MI6 building from the early on, from the, the First World War. This was the sort of Bulldog Drummond character, uh, Mansfield Cummings, he actually had a house in Queen Anne's Gate and he had a tunnel built into this building, this nondescript building, which I thought was sounded too James Bond, but in fact they did actually sell that house a few years ago and it does list a tunnel that's been blocked up. So I think when they portray him having an office like that uh, in Bond films, there may be some truth to it of M. Uh, of course, this was the home of the Cambridge Spy Ring, of Graham Greene, uh, Kim Philby and so on. They all worked out of that office. Kim Philby famously used to go to St. James's Park's tube station, sit on the bench, leave his briefcase there, and then his Russian handler would then uh, come and sit on the bench and pick up the briefcase. And the bench is still there. Uh, St. Ermans Hotel, well known for its spies, especially in the 1940s. And it was the uh, where SOE started. Uh, famously, um, Churchill apparently had a meeting over a bottle of champagne with Ian Fleming and Noel Coward and came up with the idea of the Special Operations Executive in that hotel where it was based. 
GCHQ uh, was in Palmer Street in that very nondescript building just along there for many years uh, and allegedly would bug the London embassies from there. And now we get to the great uh, masterpiece uh, of uh, the modern movement, uh, Sir Basil Spence creation of 1978. How did that end up next to Queen Anne's Gate? How do we end up in Whitehall? You may wonder. Well, actually, there was a plan. And it was those two well-known revolutionaries, Macmillan and Douglas Hume. They wanted to knock down Whitehall. Uh, they hired uh, Sir Leslie Martin, great professor of archaeology, to demolish Whitehall. They came up with a blueprint, a modernist blueprint, with mega structures. And Harold Wilson came in, he thought, what a wonderful idea. Let's get rid of all these old fireplaces, these old buildings. Let's knock it all down, including Parliament. And this is the plan. So you see, the only thing that was going to remain was uh, the uh, Elizabeth Tower uh, and the Victoria Tower, uh, Foreign Office, Home Office, all those buildings replaced by mega structures, stacks of plates. Uh, there's a new conference center there. Um, all the way up Victoria Street it was all this great modern plan all through the 60s. This is what was going to happen. Uh, and you may think, well, good thing that didn't happen, but some of it did. Uh, QE2 Conference Centre, exactly the plan. There it is. And if you go up Victoria Street, there's the business building, exactly the plan, all the way up Victoria Street, round to Scotland Yard, all built to plan as is, was Marsham Street on the old gas works. Uh, so uh, the Home Office building was very much part of that plan, that modernist plan, that modernist architecture, uh, built solidly to uh, defend against IRA bombs. So unfortunately now it's not very good for Wi-Fi because of that. Um, so Basil Spence, of course, made his name. Uh, he was on the D-Day landings actually, but he made his name with Coventry Cathedral. Um, and, uh, and also the New Zealand Parliament. I'll leave you to guess which building he designed there. Um, but uh, because it was a, at that time, it was a military base, didn't go through planning. So it, it only became public knowledge uh, what the building was gonna look like after the uh, enabling works had gone in and it caused a controversy. There was a, a, a Lord's debate on it. Now, uh, I, I, you notice I, I draw your attention to the captain of the yeoman of the guard. Well, there was a Lord Strabolini um, who spoke, who was captain of the yeoman of the guard. He spoke in this debate in 1972. And he said, it would be a tragedy and a travesty of good planning if having pulled down one of the most hideous buildings in London, we were to replace it with something even more hideous. And indeed, what is worse, with something that is even more obtrusive. So, uh, and of course, Norman St. John Sievers was famous for his remark uh, where he said, Basil Spencer's barracks in Hyde Park ruined that park. In fact, he has the distinction of having ruined two parks because of his home office building, which towers above St. James's Park. Uh, but it's created a history of itself. That site has been an important site for the Ministry of Defence, uh, home office since 1978, of course, the passport office at Clive House opposite. Ministry of Justice since 08, since I've been there. It's the home now, Lord Chancellor, Attorney General, Law Commission, Government Legal Department. And I just brought, bring your attention to Ken Clark and Jack Straw, who've got the unique, uh, uniquely have occupied that building, both as Home Secretary, Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor. David Blunkett, because he occupied the building and he's the only government minister that I know of who was blind when he was in office as was John Milton on the same site. And uh, David Cameron uh, was a spad for Michael Howard there. So if you go online now, you will see that 102 is commemorated as one of the great brutalist masterpieces in London. And that is the end of my show. And I'm open to the audience. That's absolutely um, super, Brian. Um, uh, really a tour de force and a sweep through the um, the area. Um, really uh, uh, absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, and it's very interesting because uh, many of the people who are uh, tuning in today, um, married in Caxton Hall, live in artillery mansions and Queen Anne's Gate. Um, so it's very um, 
really very fascinating uh, for us. And I always thought that Petit France was such a boring street, but it's certainly no longer. <laughs> certainly it was Victor who brought it alive in terms of the uh, John Milton superimposition of the home. So yeah. um, uh, uh, marvellous. Um, and I love all the old maps too, very colourful. Um, and I think I'm going to come back to this talk time and time again. Uh, thank you. We'll give you a proper thank you at the end. But Jules, are you um, around just to help with the questions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stuart asks, 1922, or Stuart says, 1922 saw a lot of name changes of streets to avoid duplication of London street names. And there was another, York Street, then reversion to the former name. Uh, Jilly Griffin says, great presentation, thank you. For me, Petit France was always the home of the passport office. Yeah, I think that's me as well. Um, uh, always a queue um, outside the, the passport office. Um, Paul Geddes says, um, so much I didn't know. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much and so sorry. The dog's coughing was unmuted. That's okay. Uh, we didn't all hear it, I don't think. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, Barry says, um, you mentioned the Adam and Eve pub. Do you know anything about the origins of others, such as the Star and Crown and the Buckingham Arms? I'm just trying to think where the Star and Crown is. Um, yeah, Buckingham's opposite the barracks. So Star and Crown, I can't think of that one. Uh, I, I don't know. What, one thing I have uncovered is that the, the uh, inns and taverns and so on tend to be very well documented because of the licensing requirement. And the records seem to be very good. Uh, if you ever wanted to know about a pub, uh, they've got amazing records of pubs going right back. Uh, for instance, in Tothill Street, they've got records of the builders who are who were living in the inns when they were building Westminster Abbey. So it is, uh, they are a great source of history, but I don't, I'm not familiar with those exactly. And I did do a search on the Buckingham pub because I did wonder about that because I love that pub. It's a lovely old character to it, but I don't know much about the history of it. I don't know quite uh, where it goes back to. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the idea of uh, the street holding a referendum, and that was that's yeah, very rather local. current as well too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah. Local London, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, no, excellent talk. Thank you so much um, from Agabi. Um, did and Fiona says, um, did you see that opposite the bond? Sorry. Uh Shall I say what I was yes, saying? Yes, uh, go ahead. Was, um, did you see that opposite the bombs, Queen Anne's Mansions, there was um, a Dirty Dicks tavern? There was a sign for Dirty Dicks. I wonder oh, what right. that was. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in Dick's the photo. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Well spotted. Yes. Okay, yeah. that would have been uh, Dick Turpin, yeah. I see we've got a Mr. Turpin in the audience, have we, today? Yeah, we do indeed, yes, John <laughs> Turpin, yes. I don't know, John, anything to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Chris Dawes says, pedantically, the home office I he knew as Queen Anne's Gate, where does it meet 102? Also, obscurely, how did wool processing in Flanders relate to wool processing in Guernsey and Jersey? Hmm. Right. Uh, so, sorry, what was the first part of it? Uh, yeah, he says the Home Office. I, oh, right, yeah. So when, when it was the Home Office, what happened was, when it was the Home Office building, because uh, it, 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 it's on the, the vehicle entrance is on the Queen Anne's Gate in that side road that goes up to Queen Anne's Gate. So that's also, that's the, is the entrance to the building as well. So when it was the Home Office, they used that as the postal address, Queen Anne's Gate. Mm -hmm. uh, when it was renovated uh, to make the Ministry of Justice, uh, they then decided to use the Petit France address, I guess, to differentiate, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, uh, it is a very pleasant building to work in, whatever mm. your views might be on, on, the, on the outside. It's, uh, it does work very well now. It's been renovated. Apparently, it was horrible in the 1970s, all little rooms, but it's all sort of open plan now. And of course, if you're lucky to get a view over the park, 
It's really mm. quite magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything about the wool processing in Flanders relating? Oh, uh, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, he had great uh, uh, ambitions in France, apparently, uh, Edward III. Um, so he, he wanted, I think partly he got blown off course, I think. Uh, how, that's how he ended up uh, at Le Havre or around there, landing there. But I think he wanted to uh, establish a, a base nearer Flanders, but he, he, he uh, apparently the, the, he got blown out to the, the, the west. But he was going to link up with a uh, prince in Flanders, and he, he had an alliance, and because he, he was very keen on building this wool trade even then, uh, apparently. Yeah. So he did have a, a strategy. Nah. Okay, super. Um, Barry asks, um, the now old star is opposite Underground Station on corner of Queen Anne's Gate. I, he used to see Ken Clark regularly having a lunchtime pint in the Buckingham Arms with his minder when right. Home Secretary. Nice story. <laughs> right. For, I can tell you when he became Secretary of State for Justice, I was working there then, and they, they announced it on the news that, you know, Cameron had appointed him. And of course, usually when the minister is, he goes to Downing Street, he's appointed and immediately goes to his new department. You know, he can't wait to get there. So the permanent secretary goes out to greet him, thinking he'll be around any minute from Downing Street, stands out in the street. And I remember going in and out of the building and permanent secretary was there waiting a very long time, must have been an hour and a half, thinking, Where's Ken Clark? You know, they were expecting him. And the Downing Street said, yeah, he's left, he's on his way. Uh, well, he'd, of course, he'd only stopped off in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a tremendous minister, yeah. Can I mention, um, I can't make the, mute, the, 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 the chat work. It's just a, a couple of things. Fascinating talk, thanks very much. There's one slightly sad thing that the, 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 the explanation about the Adam and Eve pub and the relationship to Milton is no longer there. They've taken it away. And I, I tried to find out if they could get it back and they showed, showed some interest, but I haven't heard from them since. Oh, right. The other thing is a question. Do we know where the Duke of York actually lived in, in Petit France? Yeah, apparently he did. That's what my, I did read that somewhere. Do we know he was what, a resident. Do we know where? Oh, where? No, I don't know where. Because it, it doesn't sound like a, a place for a, someone of his eminence in a way. Yeah, you wonder, but that's what I, I read. But yeah, I don't know more than that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, has anybody got any other questions? I think we've dealt with the ones in the chat, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. Otherwise, that was great, Brian. And um, really uh, I was taking copious uh, notes, but I'm really going to need to look at the <laughs> recording again. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that um, we will be sending an email out within the next maybe four or five days together with um, the recording uh, and link to our YouTube channel. So rather like me, you'll be able to keep tuning in to see all, all of these um, details. I'm going, going to particularly research Cromwell's Earth Wall. And that's some, one of the many things that I really felt I didn't know. And right. it's amazing, Brian, because many of the, the talks that we've had here on the Thor Thorny Island have been done throughout the period of lockdown. And I was thinking, gosh, I haven't nearly been as productive in terms of my research. But on the other hand, we have put on a huge number of Zoom talks for those of you who have. So mm. please continue with your research and we'll right. carry on producing marvellous talks for everyone else from Thorley Island. Would everyone like to clap or raise their hands and say thank you or unmute? Hugely grateful. Thank you, Brian. Fabulous. It was a great pleasure. I was very pleased. Lovely, Brian. Thank, thank you. you so much. Great. Thank you.